Okay, so group call 21st of June 2023 and getting into it we've got the dollar and does the market believe the fed dot plots and it doesn't look like it it does not look like it at all so pretty much the fed were hawkish right in terms of um in terms of their rate hikes sorry one second yeah, in terms of their, uh, their their rate heights and dot plots, but uh, the, the the dollar has kind of sold off uh, a, a bit. One second, right? Yep. So the dollar is uh, is um, it sold off a bit last week, and then it's kind of strengthened again this week. And really, all eyes are on uh, Fed Chair. Jerome Powell uh, delivering um, his semi-annual testimony to Congress. And so I remember somebody asked me earlier, um, uh, basically uh, what what Powell is going to say or what I think is going to happen um, in relation to, you know, maybe some dollar strength or weakness. Um, it's pretty much been planned out. You know, everything's kind of been expected. And here, this is a report from MUFG, and they said basically everyone is expecting a strong higher for longer message from Powell, um, but it is uh, very hard to envisage this message resonating with the market in a dramatically different way to last week, which we would sum up as sceptical acceptance, right? So the market was very sceptical uh, with regards to the, uh, the dot plot um, and the increased uh, potential rate hikes that the uh, Fed were forecasting. So with one second, so, so with um, where am I? Sorry, uh, it says with the incoming data uh, between now and the July meeting being the true determinant of whether the FOMC hikes or not. So that's really the key, yeah? It's not really about what he says, and Ken pretty much said it's a non-event today, and I would probably have to agree with him. It's pretty started now, isn't it? I think it's three o'clock. Um, pretty much a non-event, it should be anyway. The data has to support the narrative, so it doesn't matter what Jerome Powell says today. Um, you know, it's all about, you know, whether inflation uh, stays sticky, right? And so um, it says, with just one non-farm payroll and CPI report before the July meeting, we can't say with much confidence that the FOMC will not hike, but by September, we um, we be much more confident of the FOMC being done hiking by then. So the US economy is not as strong as made out by the FOMC members, and that should be apparent by then. In the meantime, beyond some modest US dollar and rate moves back and forth, the markets will likely await key data points to determine the Fed action, absolutely. So the PCE inflation next week, the ISM and non-farm payrolls the following week, and the CPI the week after. So pretty much have a roadmap, right, as to what um, the market is looking at as to determine whether uh, the likelihood of a rate hike um, or or not, right, in the, in the, in the coming, um, you know, July and September meetings. And so this was just another... Um, I guess from MUFG as well, I think it must have been the day before, pretty much just echoing the same sentiment. And it says that we continue to believe that building evidence of disinflation pressures will discourage the Fed from following through on current plans to deliver two more hikes and see room for the US dollar to weaken further as the Fed becomes less hawkish. So they're basically betting on inflation coming down. But Goldman says market is too optimistic on the pace of US inflation drop. So this was from last week and inflation in the US won't come down as quickly as markets are currently pricing according to strategists at Goldman Sachs Group. And so uh, they pretty much forecast um, stickier inflation compared to what the market is implying. And so I know uh, Ken and Igor have had their back and forth lately in the group with regards to who's going to be right on the uh, on the euro or the dollar. And one of the things I would say about that, it's always you know healthy to have these discussions and debates. Um, Ken says he's going down. Um, <laughs> I would I would say um, I don't know, right? I don't know who's right. I can you can make the argument for both, right? I can understand the argument for the euro going higher based off of, you know, interest rates 
um, you know, and then being quite hawkish. <clears throat> and you can also make the um, the argument for the, for the for the dollar as well if they do continue to hike and inflation remains sticky. Um, and also the fact that their economy is actually holding up better than the than Europe, right? And so Europe are actually in a technical recession. The market doesn't seem to be, you know, caring about that at all. So um, yeah, the broker always wins either way, right? Either way, Daniel, you're absolutely one hundred percent correct. But just for those traders who are unsure on which way to trade the euro dollar, if you're unsure, don't trade it. That's pretty much the message, right? Um, you're going to have moments where things are not as clear um, on every single pair, right? Just look for pairs where, um, you know, monetary policy divergences are a lot clearer, right? So, for example, recently um, with the New Zealand dollar going into a recession and, you know, the, the, the RBNZ pretty much saying that they're not going to hike, it's a no-brainer to go short on the, on the New Zealand dollar, right? That's pretty much um, you know, a standard trade and a trade that I took um, last week it was the uh, New Zealand dollar uh, CAD, um, the pound New Zealand. I'm out of that trade now. Um, and I entered into a new short on the New Zealand um, yen, which is now um, pretty much a break even trade. I can't lose from it. I'm in some profit, but I can't lose from that trade if, you know, the, the second position stops me out, right? But the point being is that there are clearer trades. The, the New Zealand yen isn't necessarily the clearest trade in the world, but something like the pound New Zealand was and the New Zealand CAD was because both the New Zealand, sorry, both the British and uh, the, the Bank of England and the Canadian dollar, uh, Bank of Canada, were um, hiking rates, whereas uh, the New Zealand dollar weren't, right? They've come to the end of their hiking cycle and in fact, they're now in a recession. So it made sense uh, to... Uh, to buy those over in New Zealand dollar, right? So look for the clearer uh, trades if, you know, you don't have to trade Europe and you don't have to trade against um, the uh, the um, the US dollar, right? And so um, there are, you know, it's not a one-way bet, although there are, you know, the, the market seems to not believe the Fed at all when it comes to hiking rates twice at least, um, you know, the data has to support that narrative, right? So next week, as we do start to get uh, CPI data and PCE data, that's going to really determine what um, whether you do want to be a buyer of the dollar or not. <clears throat> uh, Ken says, I don't think it's happened in the history of the Fed. What's that? What's that? What, what, you, what don't you think has happened in the history of the Fed? Uh, is, that, is that inflation? Is that well, the, the Fed being right about inflation? Uh, pause and then hike again. Mm, okay, mm, interesting one. But it's but you know what it is as well, Ken. Other central banks are, you know, central banks tend to take the uh, either you know kind of cues from each other. So with the Australian bank doing you know pausing then hiking, with the with the Canadian dollar pausing for a long time and then hiking again, it's possible that you know if we're looking at maybe global inflation. Uh, global inflation fears, you know, because commodity prices, or commodity prices have kind of come down a bit. But um, you know, it was it was possible that the Fed could also look to hike in tandem with those central banks too. So there was always the potential for them to do it. They obviously paused, and um, you know, uh, uh, just because it's, it's never happened in the past doesn't mean it can't happen in the future, right? There's always going to be firsts. But um, let's see what happens. I think if inflation remains sticky, then their mandate is to get inflation down to the 2% target. So it wouldn't be a shock if they hiked again, right? It wouldn't be because other central banks have done it. So let's uh, let's see. Let's see what happens. But yeah, definitely keep a close eye on that. Um what else was there? So the ECB, right, moving on to Europe. And so ECB rate hike in September wouldn't be a surprise, Simkus says. So European Central Bank Governing Council member, uh, Mr. Simkus, said he wouldn't be surprised if officials, if officials lift borrowing costs again after the summer. So he's obviously, you know, very uh, hawkish. And um, I think the money market is as well. So traders 
fully price 4% peak ECB rates for the first time since March. So bets follow a hotter than expected inflation print in the UK. And <clears throat> the ECB Schnabel warned against complacency about inflation. So again, hawkish. And so traders raised bet, uh, bets on further European bank interest rate hikes after a hotter than expected inflation print in the UK bolstered the case for more tightening. And so, again, going back to what we were talking about with regards to other central banks hiking in global inflation, if, you know, if the if the UK, I know they're kind of, you know, on, on the other side of the uh, of the Atlantic and that, but it could be a situation where if inflation remains sticky in, in several parts of the world, um, the Fed might be thinking it might remain sticky, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the States. And so with that, um, if European, um, if traders are betting that Europe is likely to hike rates and keep, you know, rates elevated to maybe 4% based off of just what's happening in the UK, then um, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, the Fed, you know, are thinking the same thing in terms of inflation being sticky. So, yeah, money markets are fully pricing in a 4% terminal rate by October with a quarter point hike at next month's meeting seen as an almost a done deal according to swaps tied to policy meeting dates. The last time such a level was priced was in March. And so... Um, it says, I'll just read this last paragraph. It says, data released on Wednesday showed UK inflation remained higher than expected for a fourth month, ratcheting up pressure on the Bank of England to hike rates more aggressively and keeping investors concerned about sticky consumer price growth worldwide. So it's worldwide inflation that is uh, an issue. And that kind of segues quite nicely to, in fact, the UK. So UK UK rates seen hitting 6% after core inflation shock. City investors are ratcheting up their expectations for Bank of England interest rate rises following the shock rise in core inflation. So um, that's pretty much it. The markets are pricing in the UK. Uh, we'll hit 6% uh, by December up from 45 today. So that's still a lot of rate hikes, by the way. You know, it's another... 1.5%, uh, 150 basis points um, uh, uh, to price in. So, <clears throat> yeah, today wasn't great. And we have uh, core inflation as well, which is one of the measures, I think probably the key measure, you've got headline inflation, you've got core inflation. And, um, you know, core inflation is, is what central banks are really looking at. And, um, yeah, core inflation seems to be rising. So this is a huge problem for the Bank of England and the rest of us. Core inflation, excluding food and energy, is no longer just sticky. It's actually heading in the wrong direction. Uh, welcome, George. I'm just going to mute you. So that is, you know, whereas other central banks, I think their inflation, core inflation, is slightly coming down or just remaining um sticky whereas you know the uh, core inflation for the uk is actually you know rising so that's uh, a, a major problem and so again this is from mufg they said that their call for tomorrow was 25 basis points but they lean slightly more in favor of 50 basis points now given the terrible inflation print like before uh, more aggressive action uh, should help boost pound in the near term but investor concerns will likely build over the growth implications which will limit the scale of appreciation at higher levels possibly approaching the 130 uh, 1.3 uh, level in the pound dollar and so that's an interesting point and it's something that I keep you know saying we can focus on interest rates and banks being hawkish and, and hiking interest rates but the um, the counter or the downside to hiking rates is that you know you're 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 contracting the economy because of uh, borrowing and lending costs and in, and in the UK you have quite a, uh, a, a a serious problem when it comes to um, uh, mortgage rates right but before we get there it says UK headed for a recession if rates reach six percent economy says and it says Britain could tip into a shallow recession if the Bank of England pushes its benchmark lending rate to six percent as investors expect and then an, um, an, an, an analysis by Bloomberg economics show gross domestic product would shrink about 3.3 percent this year and by 1.4 percent in 2024 according to research based on uh, Bank of England's SHOK model that assumes 
the central bank delivers 1.5 percentage points of uh, hikes to the benchmark lending rate after the quickest tightening cycle in 40 years. And it says our own view is that <clears throat> the uh, the pricing is probably overdone, says Dan Hansen, an economist at the Bank of England. I think that's, that, that sounds for anyway, BE, um, or no, BOE's Bank of England, so BE is probably something else, uh, wrote in a published uh, uh, note published today. Um, and it says BOE judged significant slump. There was something else in here. Uh, it says investors race to add more bets to um, bets on higher rates over the past few weeks, almost fully pricing in a surge to the highest level in two decades. Markets are now betting rate uh, rises at least a quarter point on Thursday to 5% by August and almost 6% by February. And this is it. So it talks about rates at that level would send mortgage rates further into territory the BOE has identified as painful for households with more than 1 million required to refinance loans at significantly higher costs this year. And so, and, and it would produce a contraction in GDP, uh, but a less severe one than suffered during the pandemic lockdowns or in 2009 in the wake of global financial crisis. Well, I wouldn't expect it to, um, you know, to, to, for that to contract the economy that much. That was, um, you know, those, those are kind of black swan events, but it would chat, it would pose a challenge for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak um, election. So, again, um, you know, UK homeowners to face £2,900 mortgage shock next year. And I think that's actually quite on the low end um, of things if, uh, you know, mortgage mortgage prices go up. And this I just want to play this, um, this video uh, for anyone who is wondering why well you know you get pretty much the same thing everywhere right you got you know mortgage house prices kind of go up in uh, all over the place and mortgages anyway mortgage rates but um i just want to play this uh this uh this video which would explain pretty much why the uk um kind of uh, hurts a bit more when it comes to uh, mortgage rates going higher due to basically you know refinancing and short refinancing terms but let's um i'll play it now yeah let me know if you can hear it I still hope that the Bank of England now isn't sort of springing into panic mode and thinking that they need to drastically change the outcome of their decision tomorrow. But I don't know, is 50 basis points a drastic change? I mean, what, what you know, does it make more sense for, for them to actually hike more tomorrow and then wait and see how the July numbers come in? I actually don't think so. I think sticking with what would have probably everybody agreed being the case before this inflation no. um, reading and sticking with a 25 basis point is still the right thing to, to do. And mm -hmm. I think the messaging from the Bank of England needs to be, yes, inflation came in higher than consensus expectations, but that is because it is taking time for the hiking we've already done to feed through. And it's very important to remember that the Bank of England has a trickier job to manage the housing market and the mortgage situation mm -hmm. and then other developed market central banks like the ECB like the Fed the situation is a lot more precarious in the UK you, meaning that if mortgages go too high then they they could have a recession on their hands because of the number of mortgages available and the fact that they roll over right every, every exactly year. it's relatively unusual yeah. to have a situation in the UK where you know a five-year fixed mortgage is actually considered a long-term fix it's very unusual in the US in no. France in in Germany in a lot of the European markets you can fix a mortgage for the duration of it so here the pain is going to be a lot more stark once that time comes which I think is going to be later this year and into 2024 yeah so um, pretty much a lot of um, 
you know, people are going to be, you know, have to their, their um, refinance their mortgages and the terms of their mortgages are coming to an end uh, this year. Hence, um, you know, you're going to have uh, going to have issues. Right. And a lot of people, um, you know, if, they, if you're on like a two year mortgage, for example, um, or two year term and, you know, two years ago, interest rates were at probably somewhere like maybe half a percent or something like that, right? So let's go to the uh, countries, um, United Kingdom, and you look at interest rates, right? Even just looking at it from a, from a year ago, right? You're looking at 1% from 20 April 2022 a year and a year and a bit ago yeah so if you if you would pretty much you know started your mortgage in 2021 where uh, you know rates are pretty much at rock bottom and now you've got a you know re refinance remortgage the, the terms you're now thinking to yourself oh my days pretty much you'll find yourself up here right so um and that's going to hurt a lot more uh, UK homeowners in terms of uh, repayments on their interest. And so with that, um, where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Yep, that is pretty much um, uh, the UK at the moment. I think short term, short term, uh, the UK should still be a buy on the hawkish central bank, but one of the things to look towards when you know looking at the peak of um the uk and whether and, and buying the pound is when you start to see really the the interest rates take effect and that's what she was saying as well because there, there is a lag we, we spoke about this last week and in the past few weeks is that the lag in interest rates on the economy and the effect of interest rates on the economy lags and so, um, you know, later on this year, they're expecting that to actually show its head. Um, and hence the reason why she thinks that, in fact, the Bank of England should only really raise by 25 basis points rather than 50. Um, because we're yet to see uh, the effect of uh, interest rates in the economy. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one for the, um, for the Bank of England. But in currency land... While they're still hiking, I think uh, any pullbacks on the pound, at least in the short term, is still a buy. And so um, I wanted to actually go on to just uh, the Australian dollar. Um, hawkish expectations adjusted. And so there was this article. Many of you probably noticed that the um, uh, the Australian dollar sold off at pretty much the beginning of the week. And it was mainly due to this. So it said, and I'll just uh, make the make this a bit bigger. It says the close nature of the decision and strong case for a pause prompted traders to pair bets that the RBA will hike twice this uh, twice by year end. Right. So they were basically potentially pricing out or pair it. I would say actually I wouldn't say pricing out, but they were kind of maybe a bit more cautious that they will hike twice this year, which is basically what uh, had been expected ever since they did their surprise hike. The Australian dollar dropped the most in three weeks and the yield on policy sensitive, sensitive free year notes erased a gain of as much as six basis points while stocks extended gains. And so um, because, you know, the Bank of um, the Reserve Bank of Australia weren't, you know, super hawkish. Uh, the market was like, hmm, maybe there might be uh, some doubt in, you know, their pricing. But going to the RBA tracker, it looks like um, so far, this is the latest day. This is the 19th, although it's the 21st. One second. Uh, let me just refresh the page. Well, it's still saying the uh, the 19th. And so it's still at 51% uh, as of two days ago. So that might have come down a bit when they do update this. Um, so let's see what happens uh, with that. But I don't think that the, that the Australian dollar is, is, a, is a sell. Although looking at, <clears throat> for example, uh, China um, and they did end up cutting rates. 
Um, but I don't think the rate cuts were enough. And so um, it says so far today, the rate cuts, one second, let me just zoom in. It says so far today, rate cuts isn't breathing life into risk assets and perhaps quite the opposite. If you look at, if you look over to the Chinese yuan and Antitopians, Antipodian, sorry, itself, uh, Aussie dollar is down 0.7% and the upside run starts to lose momentum after nearly touching six, Six point uh, six nine cent at the uh, end of the last week, and talk about the equities, and it says that could be the market's way of saying that the rate cuts are telling of more problems than it being more. Um, sorry, I read that again. That could be the market's way of saying that the rate cuts are telling of more problems than it being a solution to China's recent economic struggles. And so, um, as I've said before, I think for me to be out and out bullish. Um, you know, um, on the trade idea of China, I'd have to um, really see some data support that. So far, the Australian dollar um, is is being supported really by uh, you know the, a hawkish RBA. Um, but I do think that any pullbacks in the um, with the Australian dollar, I think are. Uh, buying opportunities still although it's not being supported by uh, China at the moment they are still hawkish and inflation is still uh, to the upside right and you know labor demand um, unemployment is still very low yeah so Australia's job vacancies are still high and unemployment is low and they need that actually to reverse in order to get inflation down or to to help to get inflation down anyway um so for me, Australia is still a buy. So this could be some nicer uh, buying opportunities. Uh, looking at uh, Canada, and Canada continues to be for me a buy. There was some news. Where did I put it? Um, it was the retail sales. I know. Um, I think Ken had uh, posted it. Right. Yeah. So uh, Canadian consumers keep on spending despite rate hikes, and so retail sales jump one point one percent. Uh, and are on track to rise again. So Bank of Canada is still trying to slow demand and curb inflation. So as long as, uh, you know, uh, Canadian, it says Canadian uh, consumers showed little sign of slowing down with stronger than expected spending at the beginning of the second quarter seen holding firm in May. And so um, the data suggests that Canadian consumers were still dining out, traveling and spending on major purchases such as cars. Their resilience defied expectations that a country's deeply indebted households would uh, respond more quickly and negatively to an aggressive hike campaign of interest rate hikes by the Bank of Canada. Strong economic momentum since the central bank declared a pause in January prompted policymakers to raise the benchmark overnight rate again to 4.75% earlier this month. The move upended markets, right? So no one was really expecting that and swaps um, uh, traded are ramping up bets on another rate hike at the Bank of uh, at the bank's next meeting on July the 12th. And so, um, again, this is what you're seeing is um, the data supporting the narrative, right? So you have a strong Canadian economy pretty much defying expectations. And so why wouldn't the Bank of Canada continue to hike if they can? Um, we'll say if they can. Why wouldn't it continue to hike in the face of high inflation? Um, because the economy can support it, right? And in fact, the economy is doing really well. So why not hike? Because it doesn't seem to be affecting the consumer, right? They're still spending money. So um, and uh, yeah, they're hot. They 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 should be hawkish on the markets. Uh, hawkish on the Canadian dollar, right? So coming off a strong first quarter of consumer spending, a second consecutive monthly move higher is not what the Bank of Canada will be looking for as it hopes to slow domestic demand. And they need domestic demand to slow so that they can get inflation down, right? So Randall Bartlett, um, Senior Director of Canada, Canadian e Economics at uh, Desargins uh, Security said in a report to investors. So although it's saying that the Bank of Canada doesn't doesn't you know uh, doesn't want that to happen of course they don't because they want inflation to come down but as you know if i'm buying the uh the the canadian dollar then in fact i do want it to keep going higher right it's um they're trading the opposite way but um but yeah this is some positive news so again if you're in any canadian dollar trades then why come out of that trade especially you know if you're if you're trading against and you should be trading against a uh, currency that is you know um, objectively weaker um 
one second, I just go to the comments and Ken says, maybe I should listen to Igor and sell CAD and Euro uh, be dollar based on the price. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't. Yeah, that, that dollar CAD um, trade idea, I saw that as well. And I was thinking, hmm, I don't really want to um, uh, get involved in that. But it's Igor's money, of course, you know, and um, uh <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't want to say that, but yeah, it, it it's not the strongest divergence in the world. I get I get why you would want to buy the dollar, right? In terms of, I can see the positives around the dollar, um, but again, when choosing what you want to trade against the dollar, you know, I think the Canadian dollar was probably one of the worst. Um, uh, trades, you know, or pet or currencies you could have uh, could have taken. You know, like I said, it, you know, the New Zealand dollar, even the Japanese yen, um, you know, could have been one. Um, yeah, not many people do, Ken. But um, but yeah. Anyways, let's. Uh, the Canadian dollar for me is still a buy. Uh, so Aussie CAD yen. So again, dovish Uwey is still. There was some talk, and there's always going to be talk about this yield curve control uh, when it comes to Japan and the potential for a shift. Um, you know, still many economists say that uh, say every meeting could result in a sudden change in shift in yield curve control has come as a surprise to avoid massive bond sell-offs before an official announcement. And so, yeah, there's there's a, what was it? It says a Bank of Japan board member hinted at the need to consider revising the yield curve control program. How many times have we heard that? It's like the boy who cried wolf. I don't know if many of you or anyone knows that story or people that don't know the story, the boy who cried wolf. Does anyone not know that story? Does anyone not know that story? All right, everyone, yeah, everyone knows it. Right, it's basically, that's what it is. Right, Daniel? Um, the boy who cried wolf is just, you don't know the boy who cried wolf, uh, George. Right, okay, so just pretty much on a very short story is basically there was a town and there was a boy, there was, a, there was some wolf, there was a wolf that was terrorizing the town right and this young boy um you know uh wanted to play a joke on the town and so um they would have a a system where you know if you saw the wolf you would cry wolf right so the boy thought it'd be funny to uh to cry wolf right so he cried wolf and all the townspeople came out and there was no wolf and then the boy said ha 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 ha, ha. i fooled you all fooled you all right so he did it a second time Everyone came out and he said, ha, 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 fooled you again, fooled you again. He did it a third time. Now, of course, people, the townspeople said, oh, it's, it's him again saying it's wolf. In fact, the third time, it really was a wolf, yeah, and the wolf ate him, yeah. So um, the point being is basically <laughs> story time with Leon. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, yeah, you know, um, we don't that uh, you know. The moral of the story is basically don't cry wolf in it. You know what I mean? Like if if you don't lie about things, and not to say people are lying, but you know people are less likely to believe if you keep saying you know yield curve control is happening in in May, yield curve control is happening in June, yield curve control is happening in July, and in fact it might happen in July, right? But do you believe? you know, when, when people are saying that yield curve control is going to happen. If it happens, as long as we don't get eaten, you know what I mean, and we're still alive, then cool. But as far as, you know, us believing the story in July that it's going to happen, it's one of those things where, okay, all right, then maybe if it does, if it does happen, then cool. Do you know what? If they start to adjust yield curve control, we're not going to miss out. We might not catch the absolute high, but what we will do is at least catch some of the move. Do you know what I mean? When there is a pullback. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's story time. I'm not really a good storyteller, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. But yeah, that's basically Japan. So yes, there is always yield curve control potentially ending in July or adjusting. But for me, um, I did get into the... New Zealand yen on a stop hunt in anticipation of a potential 
um, you know, move. It was, again, a small position. Um, but I don't actually expect it to. I wouldn't advise anyone else to kind of start buying the yen against other currencies. But I just figured that if I'm going to buy the yen and maybe try and get ahead of, you know, this story that may or may not, you know, play out, then I think the New Zealand dollar is going to, would be the, um, the best trade or the, uh, you know, because the New Zealand dollar, you know, one of the weakest, right? So that would be um, the trade. But if we're talking about, you know, euro yen at the moment and looking to, you know, short the, the yen against the euro or, or buy the yen against the euro, it's not something that I would, I would personally do or against, you know, the, the Canadian dollar or against, you know, the Swiss franc. It's not something that I would actually um, advise. It's not really on my list of things uh, to do. So small position on the yen just in case, but uh, I'm at break even now, so I can't lose on the trade. Um, but overall, I would say Japan is still a sell on the sell side. New Zealand, still a sell. Um, don't think anything's going to really happen with that anytime soon, unless you, again, you start, we start to get some good data supporting, in fact, um, the fact that they might be coming out of a recession, who knows, or the central bank is looking to, uh, hike again, as we start their hiking cycle, then things kind of, you know, change. But until that happens, as long as the RBNZ is still, um, you know, holding rates and not looking to hike rates then um, I think the New Zealand dollar is a continued sell. The Swiss National Bank, there, there was this article which came out, um, I think it was maybe a day or two ago, and it was really just talking about, you know, Switzerland has the lowest inflation of any advanced economy. Still, the Swiss National Bank President Thomas Jordan recently warned that price pressures prove more sticky uh, than expected, and therefore the fight is not over yet. So he's still very, very hawkish, very hawkish. And again, it's very surprising. I spoke about this last week. You know, typically you have central banks, once they reach their or are close to their 2% target, what they what should happen is um, that they kind of let inflation get to their 2% target naturally and start to hold rates and not hike. But, you know, he's... Um, inflation is pretty much at 2% and it, they're still looking to hike. So he sees something as a problem. But he doesn't want inflation to be a problem again. So he wants to just make sure inflation is so low, um, you know, way beyond their 2% target, maybe at 1% target before actually holding. But while they're, they continue to actually remain um, hawkish, uh, the, the Swiss National Bank has to be, or the Swiss Bank has to be a buyer, right? So you look at where, you know, everyone else is in terms of, I say everyone, but, you know, at least the Fed and the ECB when it comes to um, their uh, their monetary policy and where they are. Um, and, uh, yeah, and inflation, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, you think to yourself, we're still quite low, but, um, but yeah, it's a strange one. Uh, there was something in here as well. It said uh, interest rate hike from a level of one point five percent. Swiss officials increased the borrowing costs, and while the impetus to catch up with his peers aggressively, they also insist that Switzerland isn't out of danger, uh, even though inflation is slow to two point two percent. An underlying measure that strips out volatile um, as has core inflation. So Jordan said quite clearly, inflation pressures are still here. Uh, said Alessandro B, an economist at UBS, and I'd be very surprised if they don't leave the door open for another rate hike and more foreign exchange selling. So that's still very hawkish. B reckons a bigger half point move, one that would outpace recent action by the ECB, might confuse investors given Switzerland's more benign inflation backdrop. And so he said, um, what, I, what I could rather imagine is a 25 basis point step down, but intensifying. Um, foreign exchange sales to make monetary policy sufficiently restrictive and counteract risks of price pressures. And so, yeah, um, says the SMB will opt for more, somewhat larger step now to compensate in advance, he said. Uh, we believe the window of opportunity for hikes will close in July or August. So they're probably ending around there because the ECB and the Fed will then be at the end of their tightening cycle. So again, the central banks moving, um, you know, in tandem with each other. So, 
Um, I think that's pretty much it for all the uh, for all the banks: Australia, Canada, Eurozone, Japan, New Zealand, Switzerland, UK, and the United States. I think we've covered that all. So where are we um, when it comes to oh, as well, just from looking at uh, Canada. Where was Canada again? Right. So looking back at Canada, it looks like they are there is a ninety six percent chance. In, uh, probability that uh, the Bank of Canada hike I don't know whether whether they're um, whether their next um, rate hike opportunity or uh, meeting is actually in September I think there might be one before that but either way September it says 96% chance of a uh, of a 25% uh, basis point hike which is obviously uh, quite hawkish right so if it's ninety six percent, it must be at least a hundred percent. If if there's a meeting before that, does anyone know if there's a meeting before that? By the way, um, uh, Igor says uh, sell the cad though. I know, I know, I know. Igor sees something that we don't, but um, he could be right. You know, he could be right. It's, it's a probabilistic game. I don't know whether his um, his likelihood of being right, you know, against the market, um, it, it just depends in it. Um, but yeah, so there's that also as well. Something to keep an eye on. Going back to the to the US uh, dollar, it looks like the market is pricing in. Oh, it's, it's increased eighty one percent in July. So July, that's definitely um, at the moment. At the moment, eighty one percent. Remember, this can go up and down. And so once the data comes out, so don't think today is the day that okay, we're definitely going to remain at eighty and the eighty percent probability of a rate hike in July if inflation measures you know start to come down drastically then this is going to come down drastically because ultimately you know the fed are less likely to hike rates if there's not an inflation problem or inflation is naturally coming down so yep it does look quite hawkish at the moment and supportive of the dollar but the real test will be you know um the inflation measures next week and so with that being said um i think i will go to the spreadsheet and pairs <clears throat> so uh let's grab the pen tool in fact let's go to um what was the um right so we've got at number two we've got uh the new zealand dollar i don't think anything's really changed uh the canadian dollar is number one uh, Australia is still number two as well. New Zealand is ranked number two. Uh, number four, do we have any fours? No, so fives we have, it's like the dollar is number five and the pound is number five as well. Two sixes, which is Euro. And I think the yen should be ranked number six, yep. Yeah. And number eight is going to be the Swiss franc. So, when looking at where we are on the currency value cycle, uh, with the Canadian dollar being number one, yeah, it has to be on the currency appreciation end, right? I think number two as well for the Australian dollar, although we've had a pullback, I do think that it should want to appreciate, um, I think there's decent buying opportunities, but we have number two New Zealand dollar over here, which I think is definitely on the currency devaluation end of things based based off of just recession and the fact that they're not they're not looking to high crates um number fives was it number fives was the us and um and the uk and i do think that the uk is on the still on the revaluation end um, the US, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence with, with the US. I think the US is going to be here, right? So it's it's neither on the devaluation or revaluation end. I think, again, that de really depends on whether inflation goes higher or lower. But I'm sitting kind of on the fence with that dollar. Um, Euro and the yen, I think the euro is, again, there are, there are reasons to buy the euro because they are hawkish but keep one eye on um 
their economy and if their recession starts to get worse or there are you know measures economic measures whether it's manufacturing that starts to contract and services etc then it basically means that the they may have to actually not hike as much and can't afford to be as hawkish because they might send their economy into uh, the contraction phase um sooner right so here it pretty much is where it says um uh actually no that doesn't that's not that's not really it but yeah um but basically keep an eye on the uh gdp when it comes to euro but for now i think euro is on the uh revaluation end um and what was the other one japan japan is over here but again we could get a massive surprise um in terms of yield curve control but unless they actually do it now i think it really should be around here or at least probably if you're if you're very bullish on that yen then probably somewhere around here as well maybe just in between revaluation and devaluation and then we've got the swiss franc which is ranked number eight but because mr jordan is very hawkish has to be here on the revaluation end so when looking at pairs to kind of trade um you're pretty much looking at buying the canadian dollar and the australian dollar still um the euro the pound and the swiss franc on the fence i guess you could be on the fence with the dollar um and potentially look to sell the japanese yen but with one eye on potential yield curve control so you may or may not want to um you know buy that in fact if you if you're thinking about yield curve control coming into play then you could actually look at the re that being um a revaluation as well so the yen is a is a very tricky one at the moment but i wouldn't you know if you, you're not wrong for selling it and you're not wrong for buying it at the moment same thing with the uh with the uh with the dollar you're not wrong for selling the dollar at the moment but you're not wrong for necessarily buying it either um i think the only really out and out sell at the moment is going to be the new zealand dollar new zealand nzd is the clearest sell for me uh currently so that's really where um where i would uh i would look to uh, the currencies that i'm i'm trading against so yep once we've done that we can then oh sorry guys one second one second one second one second what have i done uh share screen yeah yeah cool yeah can you guys see my screen now can you see my screen yep all right brilliant so all right so with that being said going back to the fundamental analysis spreadsheet um i don't think nothing has changed right so pretty much selling the new zealand dollar anticipation of potential yen strength if they change your curve control i did put it on the watch list from last week if you watched the weekend video i did um put that on there but i think everything else is probably uh in place so again just short short in the uh, new zealand dollar buying a swiss franc um new zealand sorry the uh, dollar yen again watch list because you could make a, an argument for either same thing with the euro dollar same thing with the pound dollar aussie yen based off of just interest rate divergences you can look for a definite buy uh, i say a definite buy but you know i'll say i'll be more long the australian dollar than i would be on the uh than the, than the uh than the yen but again you could make the argument that you know potentially get ahead of the curve and buy the yen dollar swiss watch list um in fact i might just take that should i take it off i'll take it off matter of fact not really interested in that pair uh pound aussie nope new zealand cad i'm in that news uh as a sell aussie swiss nothing cad yen again um just interest rate divergences you can definitely look to buy that Aussie New Zealand uh that is a yeah that's a long trade there's a nice stop hunt coming up by the way on that um Swiss yen again long based off interest rate divergences currently 
and um, New Zealand dollar. I had it on the watch list. In fact, that actually worked out to be quite quite a decent trade uh, from last week into this week on the short side. Um, and if you was looking to buy the dollar again, what's weaker than the dollar, right? It has to be the New Zealand dollar, and that's why I put it on the on the watch list because I was thinking that there was there was an opportunity to to kind of buy the dollar versus the uh, New Zealand dollar, and I actually worked out, but I didn't get involved in that trade. I got involved in the uh, New Zealand yen. Um, again, pound, yen, and euro yen are trades that, based off an of interest rate divergence, you want to more likely to go long. Um, on those pairs than you would um, go short. So, uh, so yep, yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, there are some questions and chart analysis. And there was a question from, I think it might have been George. He said, hi, Leon. Uh, uh, so from my understanding right now, dollar is not so bullish and not too bearish. Exactly. Um, Great analysis. So basically, we're waiting for the data to give us a better picture as markets don't believe the Fed's hawkishness. Very astute, very uh, very good analysis. My question is, if the data is very negative for the dollar, for example, let's uh, say GDP is negative for one quarter, indicating possible recession, will the dollar have gains as a safe haven in that event? Um, so I understand that the... You know, sometimes where you have the dollar acting as a safe haven against itself, which is crazy because um, I think it was during the banking crisis. You know, there were there were there was a theme that the dollar was a buy, even though, you know, I think it was, you know, what, what bank was it again? Or the, or the banks, you know, a couple of the banks that had collapsed you know, was seen as a uh, as a risk off event, but yet you would buy the dollar, right? So it was it was it was quite confusing, because why would you want to buy the dollar in that in that situation? So for me, I wouldn't buy the dollar going into a recession. Um, if it was going into a recession, there's I think there's a lot of um, institutions that are heavily or trying to get short on that dollar because the, the short dollar trade idea is something that really should have happened from maybe March, April times um, at least and um, it hasn't materialised because the dollar, the economy has been better than expected and also as well the inflation has been stickier than expected so I do feel that sorry, there's, there's what's that I do feel but there's a lot of reports that have come out and that was saying that second half should be where the dollar does decline. We're at the beginning of the second half of the year now, pretty much, you know, mid-June heading into July. So this is possibly the beginnings of the dollar decline. But again, that has to be supported by the data. But to answer the question, if they start to go into a recession, right, and they're the only ones going into a recession, typically you probably want to sell the dollar but if there's a global recession and everyone else is also tipping into a recession then in fact it becomes a case of well who you know where do you want to put your money if everyone else is going into a recession and in that case then the dollar does typically act as a risk um off safe haven play and then money will tend tend to flow into the dollar because you know it's like saying well do if if like I said if every, if everyone else is going into a recession there's a global recession then where's where am I going to get the most bang for my buck where am I going to you know where's my money uh, kind of going to be quite safe and so um, they'll look at you know everyone and say dog with the least fleas and go all right let's um, let's put our money into back into U.S. dollars. You know, rather than putting it into maybe, you know, Canadian dollars or New Zealand dollars or Australian dollars, right? So that in that case, that's where it acts as a safe haven. Silicon Valley Bank, that was it. SVB. Yeah, makes sense. All right, brilliant. Excellent, excellent. Um, so there was also, there was also, um, what else was there? There was someone wanted some feedback on some charts, right? I think it was Deirdre. Uh, Deirdre, Deirdre, CPR feedback, and if anyone's got any charts, by the way, please post them or send them in this uh, in this chat so that I can uh, give you some some feedback on the on the charts right now. 
So CPR trade. Now this is an interesting one because it's quite a deep one, right? So you've got the Australian dollar, US dollar, and quite a nice um, move from the upside. So I'm just gonna get my pen tool, right? So typically what you'd wanna see is you, you wanna see the breakout traders get involved in this, yeah, which they are, and then you wanna see the retracement traders get caught on the wrong side and then the move to the upside, yeah? Because one of the key things is that you don't want these traders to be able to basically make any money from the trade or be able to get out of the trade. Now, there is every possibility that these breakout traders who got in around here managed to make some money as prices continue to go down. And also as well, retracement traders who got in up here made some money on the way down, right? So if they've got out of the trade, if they're out of that trade, then it means less traders are caught in their positions because they, got, they would have exited um, their position and they wouldn't be in the market anymore. So from the perspective of, you know, is this, a, C, a, a typical CPR, I would say no, but there are always gonna be traders that are gonna be trapped. And so there is a level right there where traders would have, more breakout traders would have got involved right here. Yeah, so you can see where breakout traders got involved there and then prices start to now go against them. So although I wouldn't necessarily call this level a CPR, I would call this level a CPR. So it really kind of starts from here. And especially, I'm not sure whether this area here actually, you know, looking back, if that has a historical level where prices have kind of bounced off it quite um, aggressively or vertically, then that would definitely be something I would be interested in. I'd have to double check that, but, um, but yeah. Because this is an eight hour chart right here, you can you, you know that on, on a lower time frame, let me just uh, clear this. You know that on a lower time frame that would that level would have looked actually quite um, enticing, yeah, in terms of you know quite def uh, defined um, in terms of like breakout traders looking at the level in order to get short and then we get that reversal. So I think it really starts really towards the lower end. So the 65 uh, round number, I think is where, and maybe just above that is where you probably want to look for trade right there. So that is uh, the feedback for that. I don't think Deirdre is in the group at the moment. Oh. Here she is, here she is, here she is. One second, one second guys. Let's, uh, let's get Deirdre. Where is she? Deirdre, can you hear me? Deirdre, can you hear me? We just went over. One sec, I'll wait. I'll wait for her to hear me. Um, if she can hear me, or if she can see the uh, and respond. If she does, then I'll go back to it. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, what else was there? What else was there in terms of uh, feedback? Did anyone have, else have any charts, by the way, uh, that they wanted me to go over? I can do that. Can I say something? Yes, Alexandros, how you doing? I want to apologize for something. Today I put an intraday post. I got carried away by the CPI um, um, that um, happened. And uh, it didn't turn out because I, I did get carried away. And I want to tell you know, the newer guys how easily we can get carried away, even though the, the fundamental is with us. I forgot to look at the daily chart. <clears throat> That how strong and and possible strong chances that the um, uh, um, people were li were taking liquidation and and profit taking, which is why we had a strong pullback, despite the the strong data inflation from from the UK. Yeah, it's a wrong. I was ho I was hoping there was was a nice stop hunt there, but 
intraday only. It was just an intraday trade. Right. Nobody took it seriously, you know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, re I normally get them right, but today I, I got so carried away that I forgot that we we're in a, such a high position, and that it was it was definitely liquid hunting all the way down. To not the not to worry at all, right? And really, I mean, no one really should be taking anyone else's trades as a as a signal, right? And what you what you pointed out was was actually a stop hunt, right? So it was an example, and so when we go to the dollar. All right, what you were saying was it's pretty much. Let me go to uh, uh, so where was it? What was that? A 15 minute? So, where was it? It was, it would have been somewhere what around here. Was that it? Was it there? Or am I one second? Let me go back to I, the, I went to the 1 7, now. yeah, 1 7, 1 point, sorry, 1.274. 7, 6, it was a stop hunt there, point, like all that row. It was 1. a 15 minute, 15 minute um, time frame. Intraday, it was just a quick intraday time frame. Mainly, due, yeah, and it just came slamming down. Right. Like, when the news came out, I was, it went up. Um, I waited to, for it to pull back again. And when it pulled back, I was waiting for a stop hunt. It came down, but didn't return back in. It did not return back in. Just fifteen minute time frame, nothing, nothing being. It was just a quick, a quick uh, setup. Oh quick, no, uh, you know, no, 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 no need to apologize. No need to apologize at all. One second, I'm just trying to move this out of the way, and just actually see something. So right, let me just go back to the chart. So that was a, a one point two seven fives. So 1.275s pound dollar, 1.275s, 1.275. Right. I think, yeah, I think probably that yeah, the stop hunt was probably somewhere around on a 15 minute chart. You would have had something there as far as a level. You got your level there. Well, like if if you look on there, the yeah, um, right there. a bit underneath, a bit lower is where I entered. Like I waited for it to pull back. Like the news came out, it was just right after I was waiting for the data to come out. Mm. Went up, came back. I was waiting for the pullback. I was expecting a stop hunt to okay. come down, but it, it came down and it never pulled back. So yeah, I, just, I got stopped out. So. Um, yeah. Also, as well, and as you and, and as you rightly mentioned as well, is whenever taking intraday trades, try not to trade at the highs. So one of the things, you know, I I look towards in terms of value, right? Because in expensive and cheap and bargain prices or just fair I'm value. Not, I'm not carried away, Leon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> nah, not. I knew, I knew we were with the highs ago. Okay, it would be a quick trade. It was like it was a small lot. It was nothing but yeah. It was an example how sometimes we just get carried away. Like, like I knew we're in the highs in the long term. Like, Great Breed Crown has been overpriced. Like, it, you, you can see on all the on all its pairs, it's you know everything's been priced. In. Yeah, but I'm, it was. Yeah, I, I mostly got carried away with it, with it after the CPI data. Waiting for that pullback, it came back. And I was expecting sort of like that hunt, like it happened, it came down, but that it was so strong, the selling was so strong mm. that it just took a slamming down and then, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and the thing is, I, I kind of mentioned, I mentioned this as well. Um, I think it was, I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been Mr. Diligent. But as you said, you knew that when you were, uh, sometimes when we get into trades and then when we kind of lose a trade, then, it, then instantly it hits us. It's like, oh my days, you know what? I should never have taken that trade because, and then everything starts to come to you. It happens. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? But the, but the actual setup itself, yeah. I can see actually was a was a good setup, right? You can see where you've got your support and resistance, do you know what I mean? At, and it confirmed. Like I said, the only problem is, the only issue with that, as we've you know said, is that it it's it's at a high, right? And so if it's all the way up here, if you zoom out on a daily, you're pretty much buying at these highs. I mean, you haven't even really got you know, fair, any kind of fair value, even from a two week fair value perspective, you haven't got that 
and you know for me I'm you know that's the the absolute minimum I, I kind of prefer the monthly moving fair value but I know traders you know don't necessarily want to wait that long for the monthly moving fair value to kind of hit so I introduced the two week and I found that the two week actually is really quite accurate um, when it comes to uh, you know supporting you know supported trades on the intraday and so just if you do, you know, learn from um, Alexandros' mistake, learn from everybody, everybody's mistakes, right? They say, you know, anyone can learn from their own mistakes, but the wise man learns from others. And so, um, you know, Alexandros is gracious enough to, um, to basically, you know, admit that obviously the trade didn't work out and the reasons why. Uh, and I thank, you know, Alexandros for that. Brilliant. But, and and it's, a, it's a learnable and it's a teachable moment, right? So from that perspective... Whenever entering into any trades and you see a, a, a stop hunt or a CPR really up at highs or lows, just take a moment to zoom out on the daily and go, where am I? You know, am I, you know, uh, trading around highs? Where is fair or potential measures of fair value? Yeah, moving fair value. Or even if you're just looking at it from, you know, uh, a higher, low, higher, higher perspective, right? So you got high low a high yeah so if that's an absolute bargain price because it led to new highs then if we're looking at where fair value is one sec yeah if we're looking at where fair value is from the perspective of this is expensive this is your first bargain where is fair value? And it looks like fair value, which is 50% of this high and this low, is going to be right where that actually that two week moving fair value is. So that's the moving fair value and that's the auction fair value. Yeah, as the setup, as you're saying that it is like it's, you do get carried away. It was the data that came out that which, which I knew would be because it was a strong supply zone on top. You know, because things were coming down on a daily time perspective. Yeah. And I got and I go, okay, you know, maybe intraday it'll probably come back up, and maybe sellers will come back in and bring it down again. But mm. we get carried away, you know. Like I got, it was basically the data that got me excited. Ah. Strong inflation data, like UK's inflation is not; it's just sticking like bad, and mm. it's gonna take a lot for it to come down. And, and that's why I got carried away. That, yeah. That's where. I said, okay, if it comes to these numbers, I'm going to react. But if it comes even slightly lower, I'll probably just think about it and see what happens. But it came high and I, and I finally realized I was wrong. And do you know what? You, 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 you weren't wrong. Do you know what it was, Alexandros? You're not wrong, I don't think, in your, in your analysis because it makes sense to go long. But it's just the timing, right? And, and, what, and, the, and the timing in terms of just understanding where you're looking to buy. And I guess you were used as liquidity, right? So the market, a lot of retail traders would have looked at today and said, oh, do you know what? Same thing that you did. You know, inflation came in higher than expected. It's a buy. Not realizing that, in fact, you know, the smart money, there was probably a whole load of liquidity below here. Yeah. And as I always say, if there's not enough liquidity above the market. So if you're looking to buy, there needs to be enough sell orders above the market to facilitate the buying. And if there isn't enough sell orders above the market, guess where it's going to go? It's going to take you all out, take everyone else out below the market. Yeah. Grab all the liquidity below. Yeah. But still continue because it because because nothing has changed, right? The Bank of England is still likely to hike rates. But you know what? In the short term, I might as well just take out all the liquidity behind, but below the market, and then I'll be on my way. So that's pretty much what it looks like is happening at the moment. So, and this is why I always, I always say, no matter what, just wait for that pullback. I know, for example, on that euro dollar, um, I think it was Igor was was trying to convince me to go long, and I said, well, even if I do want to go long on on the euro dollar. I still got to wait for decent prices. I still have to wait for the price. You know what I mean? I'm not FOMOing in. You know, I've, I've, I've done it too many times over the years, you know, 
um, to learn, you know, that, that, that behavior, as much as I might necessarily, I might win from up here and the prices might still go higher, right? I'd rather be patient and wait for a pullback into a setup before going um, long because understanding that, you know, you're buying at highs um, is just not what I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to do enough. I have to stay disciplined. That's what discipline's all about, right? Is trying not to FOMO, recognizing first of all the FOMO, the emotions, and then going against that because every time you do that, you just basically build that disciplined muscle and then... Um, you know, you, you, you get, it gets easier. But if you're always going to um, go against, you know, and, and give in to your emotions when it comes to trading, then you're just not going to learn the discipline. You're always going to be ruled by your emotions. So, but it happens. We all have slips. You know, we all do. I do. Um, but it's recognizing it and just saying, okay, you know, slap on the wrist. Don't do it again. And then uh, just do better next time. You know what I mean? But don't be hard on yourself, though. Don't be hard on yourself. You're human. We're all human. And we do do these things. Um, but thank you, Alexander. Just really, really appreciate that. Really appreciate that feedback. Um, what else is there? Uh, does anyone else want to talk about any charts? Oh, did you cover mine? For that I came in. When yes, I mine up. yes, okay, Deirdre. Yeah. I did cover it right, and I okay. will, and I will cover it again. Um, what? Be because, because, be yeah, because you, um, you came in just as I had finished, just as I had finished the analysis. <laughs> And um, yeah, so what, I, what I'm gonna say is this. So, um, right, the, let me just get the pen tool up. So this is a good chart, but I think you've just drawn the CPR slightly in the wrong place. And here's the reason why is because you've got a nice level here, right? Nice accurate level. And then you've got breakout traders that get involved here. Yeah, which is excellent. Then you've got the retracement traders that get involved here. Now, one of the key things you, you, you must um, have is that these traders must not be allowed to exit their trade in terms of, you know, uh, take, taking profit. Yeah. So retracement traders and breakout traders would have made money as prices came all the way down to here, yeah? So anyone who got in up here is probably looking to take profit at least to some degree down here. Retracement traders taking profit down here, yeah? Whereas what you really wanna see, and let me go back a bit, yeah, is for example, something like this where you get the retracement traders come in and then prices go against them. So breakout traders are in, price goes you know, further down, Retracement traders come in, but it doesn't allow them to really make much money. And then you see something like that. Then you get the pullback because then you know that these guys are still caught in their positions. But as prices head down here, these guys had the opportunity to make money. These guys had the opportunity to make money. So how many traders are really caught in their positions here? If they've exited the market, not, not many, right? But... But, 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 there are traders that will be caught at this level here. Because that is an obvious level that breakout traders would also want to get involved in. Yeah. And so when you start to see that happen, you know that breakout traders are here. So rather than putting it, you know, the level as up here, I would rather... I know that traders are caught down at these areas if they haven't pretty much blown up their account, um, you know, as prices are going against them up here, right? But there's going to be traders, institutions that are going to be caught down here. And that's really where you want to look for the level. So that's where it is. Although I definitely understand why you did put it here. But following it through, you can see that these traders would have been able to exit their trades with a nice little profit and then they would have they would have gone but these guys down here i think would be still be caught does that make sense makes a lot of sense yeah Thanks so much no problem I, i'm just glad um 
I'm I'm getting better at this because when I was marking stuff out before, you're like, ah, oh, Deirdre, you need to look at the zone. So then, well, it, it, I'm working. that's 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 the point, right? And just keep yeah. doing that. The repetition. Watch the videos over and over again. Keep sending over the charts, getting the feedback, improving, and you'll see in the improvement, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much. No problem. I, I actually like it a lot, so. Excellent, excellent. Also, as well, one of the things that you have to be aware of is that that level doesn't necessarily look, even though it's it's great from a local perspective, um, whenever looking at a level of a CPR, for more confluence, what you want to do is if, let's say, for example, off the chart somewhere, um, you did have a big rejection off of that level that aligns with this uh, support and resistance, then that would add some brilliant confluence because it means that there's a lot more traders looking to trade at this level because you have a, a, a bounce there and they're looking at this area in the past as to why they would want to, you know what I mean, take a trade here or take at least a breakout trade here. So if you can zoom out as well and try to see at, with any kind of a CPR level or just a support and resistance level where traders have been caught, if that level has been traded in the past. Yeah, and that adds extra confluence and confidence. Thanks so much, sounds great. No worries, no, no problem at all. So, uh, was there anything else? Was there anything else? Uh, any charts or anything like that that you wanted to, anyone wanted to go over? One second. Oh, I think I've just covered up the chat. Uh, da, 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 da. Right, so let me go back through the chat. Um, one second. Uh, oh, Ken's ribbing um, Igor, I see. <laughs> yeah. Please don't make it personal though, guys. Please don't make it personal. It's only, uh, you know, we, we, we can have ideas, trade ideas. And I was saying this, Igor, um, before that, you know, there were times where, you know, I might be long a currency, you might be short a currency. And try not to turn it into a, a competition where it's like, well, I was right and you were wrong. Or you were wrong and I was right. You know, it's it's not really that because there are reasons to buy. I can I can understand the reasons to buy the dollar, and I can understand reasons to sell the dollar. So and the same thing with the euro. And so when you have a situation like that, um, you know, both of you could be right at different times. Yeah, both of you can be right at different times depending on how you time and where you're taking the trade. But um, but yeah, I would say if you can. Um, refrain from uh what's the word I'm, I'm looking for or just just be mindful do you know what i mean of of um i guess the uh the competition or not the competition but you know what i mean just the the, the the banter that goes on between you both and i know it's banter but maybe other people may not understand it as being banter do you know what i mean so um and i know you guys have been here for a, for a while and you have a you have a, a relationship but yeah maybe others don't so uh so yeah George, no problem. Take care. This is recorded as well, so um, I'll post the recording afterwards. Um, yeah, I know it's all good, Igor. I know it's all good, and um, like I said, I know I know the uh, the banter's there, but yeah, just be be mindful that maybe not everybody I, might see I have it. A as... Yes, Rudy, one. How you doing? Hello. Hello. Yeah. I yeah. Have a question. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh... You were saying um, that the, the UCAD would have been the worst pair to trade. I was trying to figure out what, like, why. Okay, because the reason why is because you have a Canadian dollar that is seen as being strong. So I'm not sure if he was in the group when I was going over the Canadian analysis. I, yeah, I was, I was there. I yeah. Was there. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, so, so pretty much... <laughs> You're pretty much seeing that kind of play out, right? So I I understand the the um you know the the level, yeah. So it looks really nice from a from a stop hunt perspective. It looks really really nice. You've got you know actually a very accurate level as well here, yeah. So 
just right there. And when you get really accurate levels, yeah, it's a sign that institutions are there. Yeah, manufacturing the level. And so okay. so when you get something accurate like this, how many how many eyeballs are gonna be on that? That's uh you know a a, 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 a supply and demand, sorry, a, a, a support and resistance traders wet dream, right? You know what I mean? They're gonna see that and go, this is perfect. This is perfect, 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 perfect. So, but the but 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 the problem is with just with just technicals as as we know is that um, you need the fundamentals behind it. And so when you see, and that's with every single setup, not just support and resistance trading, that's with stop hunts after CPRs, that's with supply and demand. There's no technical setup that's gonna stand in the way of fundamental analysis, none. You can have, the, you can have the, the most accurate, the most, the best A1 setup, but if the market, which is driven by valuations and supply and demand and things like that and positioning, if the market doesn't think that that is a bargain based off of interest rates, inflation, you know what I mean? It's just, that's it, it's just not gonna work. It's not going to work. And so what you're seeing now is that play out, right? And so, you know, looking at the dollar, yeah, with the Fed and, and, and I get it, you know, they are looking to high rates twice, yeah, but again, the market doesn't necessarily believe them, right? The data needs to support the narrative. So right now we're in a situation where the market is basically going, hmm, I don't know, I don't think so, or some are saying that they do, right? But there's more uncertainty around the dollar. When you look at the Canadian dollar, for example, where they're, you know, they're, uh, uh, their their economy is doing well. We had some good data today in in relation to retail sales. Um, the Bank of Canada is still hawkish. Um, do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. Well, well, it, this is this. Well, well, my thing was I wasn't I wasn't there. I mean, I was bullish on the Canadian dollar. Uh -huh. You know, because the bank, you know, in the bank analysts, you know, they they analyzed it to go to you know one thirty. Mm. So. Um, you know, I wasn't bearish. Like, I, what I'm trying to understand is, okay. Sorry, Rudy, when you've cut out, you've just cut out. You said what you were trying to understand was, and then you've cut out. Oh, there was no technical setup. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Well, this technically <laughs> would have been the, the would have been the setup, and I think this is what um, I think might have been Igor had had gone for, right? So you do have this as a as a stop hunt setup, for sure. Okay. For sure, yeah. Very okay. accurate level, very you know uh, clean on the daily. Once it closed back inside the level, that's it, right? That's it. Right. But, but based off of what you said fundamentally, why would you buy the US dollar against the yeah, Canadian dollar? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Why? Even if it is technically setting up. So that's that's where I was lost at. Right, I mean, okay. I I mean I seen a trade. I thought it would go bearish and it went bearish. So yeah. I'm trying to figure out uh why would why would the stop the stop button wouldn't be valid at that point or no right i mean it, it it's valid in terms of technically but whether it's going to follow through or not is the question and the follow through is where the fundamentals come into play and fundamentally i wouldn't i wouldn't have expected this to follow through the only time i expect this to follow through is if either a you know inflation is sticky and comes out higher than expected yeah, um, next week, or if the Canadian dollar, for example, has you know some slips, trips, and falls in terms of their inflation and their economy. Yeah, but at the moment, if we're looking at divergences and what are the best, you know, uh, pairs to trade, the dollar CAD wouldn't necessarily be on my list. It was actually you say it wouldn't necessarily. It's it's not on my list of things to trade, right? It's not there because there's there's no. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, the there's edge, no the edge, for, exactly. There, 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 there. Even though the the the, num the the fundamentally it makes sense, 
if yeah. there's no setup, then there's no really reason to. I yeah. Get what you're saying. And and if I was and if I was going to take that trade in the direction, it would be in that direction, as you said, because I think the Canadian dollar is an out and out buy. Yeah, it's probably the best currency to buy at the moment, which is reflected by its number one status. And so if I was trading that pair, my bias would actually be to the downside, as you said, you know, to go back to, you know, the the one thirties, right? Somewhere yeah, around here. Yeah. So that yeah, that that would be my bias if I was gonna be a buyer or a seller of this currency pair. But again, I think there are better pairs to, to, to trade and um and so I've kind of stayed out of uh I've stayed out of that one. So it was just, I think it was just, it was only, the only reason why I mentioned it was because um I think uh what was it again? I think uh, yeah, Ken mentioned that Igor had taken the trade, so um yeah, I was I, I was just saying that it's something that I personally wouldn't have, you know, I personally wouldn't have taken. But there's trades that I would have taken that have lost and there's trades that I haven't taken that would have won, right? Nobody knows, you know, from trade from individual trade to individual trade, you know, what is going to win and what's going to lose. Um, so this is just one of those examples where it could still work out, right? It could actually still work out, but it's not necessarily something that I would do. Um, and uh, Eagle, Eagle's done his analysis and he feels that the dollar, the, the, the US dollar is the stronger out of the two. And so he decided to uh, to take the trade. Mm, okay, yeah, one, one last question. Mm -hmm. um, so with, uh, I think I've seen somewhere like China, uh, like I think you stated also that China wasn't doing as good as they expected. Yeah. Um, and you know, China being a, a, a commodity driven uh, market, I know you, you, you touched on that where mm -hmm. the, uh, the commodities are not as strong. Mm -hmm. Um, all they're really relying on is the interest rate mm -hmm. uh, push. Um, wouldn't that set up one of the commodities? And I, I know you said New Zealand was the, just the weakest out of the, out of the pairs to really match up with something, but, uh, wouldn't that trickle to the, to the Australian dollar? Cause don't they trade more with China and kind yeah. of more with, with China? So I was, so I was kind of leaning towards, you know, pairing the Australian dollar or something. If China keeps on with the narrative, oh, we missing expectations. This not working. That's not working. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm with you in so far, but I need to see the data. That's my thing, right? There needs to be data that supports China growth because once they once it does support because right so so, so basically they're cutting yeah so let's go back to the basics so China are cutting right now yeah what what right in what environment yeah does a central bank typically cut and when I say environment I'm talking about you know in what phase of the economic cycle does a um, a, a central bank cut. Is it in in the growth period or is it in the contraction period? Uh, usually in the contraction period. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So so a lot of times we don't necessarily have to. The, the the central bank is actually telling us they're worried about the economy. So if they're worried about the economy, then for me to really kind of go all in on a China trade idea. I would need to now see the effects of those rate cuts start to have an effect on the data and China's growth. So for now, I'm not convinced. Yes, you can can you can kind of try to get in early on it if you if you want right now, but I'm a bit more conservative, right? I'm a bit more conservative because the effect of a cut, right, and rate cuts should eventually trickle through to the economy, which should boost economic growth, right? Eventually. The, 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 the issue is, is the timing of that, right? That could, it could be a month, it could be two months, it could be three months. Nobody knows. So for me, I think it's probably best for the data to show, to start to show growth before then maybe you want to start buying the commodity currencies again well commodities commodities in general for example oil can be driven by other things not just not just china of course demand from china helps support you know um 
uh, 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 you know, oil prices, but you also have, for example, OPEC, right, and things like that. So um, OPEC will support prices regardless of China. And so, um, you know, China and OPEC in tandem is, is great if you've got that on your side in your trade. But if you have one over the other, that's fine too. But when it comes to the um, the uh, commodity currencies, um, not to say that you, you know the commodity currencies are a sell because you have the central bank support in the commodity currencies, right? For example, the central bank uh, of, bank of I'm Canada. I'm also saying the Canadian dollar against the Australian dollar. That's pretty much the point. Okay, so 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 okay, so so Australian dollar against Canadian dollar is something again yeah. that I would probably more not trade simply because um again you've got two competing currencies although although we do know that you can have a, a, a ranging market when you have two currencies that are both strong and that are both weak so there are opportunities to still trade those those currencies i don't know if you saw i i posted um a video on the aussie cad which Basically, there was a stop hunt involved, and what drew, what the reason why this dropped, was mainly because of what happened with the with the Australian dollar sentiment. Um, uh, the the speech that happened, and I kind of covered it earlier, where they were talking about the fact that um, the nature, the close nature of the policy decision, and strong case for pause prompted traders to pair back bets on the RBA right will hike towards the year end and so it was an opportunity really for those traders you know the stop hunt above in conjunction with the news right for it to sell off but do i think now that for example you know prices are going to con you know trend to the downside in terms of you know continuing going like all the way down here what's the likelihood probably probably not if you have two central banks that are both hiking. Prices should stay within this auction. This was a bargain for the Australian dollar. That was expensive for the Australian dollar. That was a bargain for the Canadian dollar. That was expensive for the Canadian dollar. So um, when it comes to um, the Aussie CAD, uh, it's like I said, commodity wise, I think the Australian dollar, uh, well, they say that the, uh, the, the that, the Canadian dollar benefits from you know oil prices more than Australia, but then China, you know, um, uh, them growing and importing a lot of iron ore and copper, for example, benefits the Australian dollar more. It's a it's a tough one to choose between the two. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I would say at the yeah. moment, yeah, I would say at the moment it's not really a pair that I would okay. really look to trade. Yeah. There's no difference. So until the data really starts to show up. Yeah, exactly. Looking the portrait. Exactly. Gotcha. It's just it's just looking for the divergences between them. And if you can't see any or they're very few, then just don't look to trade it. That's all. Okay, it has to be obvious. Yeah, okay. but you but you can trade, for example, the Australian dollar versus something like the New Zealand dollar, right? Um, where you think to yourself, okay, look, you know, we've got a nice stop hunt here really nice starting to set up yeah looking at where we are on the daily first of all oh that looks a bit high right okay cool if it looks a bit high then at least start to look at where we are from a moving fair value perspective right so the moving fair value we've definitely touched the two week so that's basically valid so we've, we've touched one measure of, of fair value at least and then we're coming into potentially the monthly fair value, which hasn't been touched since prices have crossed to the upside. That's always a, a decent area to look for um, a trade in conjunction with obviously other, you know, a, some sort of setup. So for me, this looks really nice because regardless of, um, you know, what was said in their speech, I know that the New Zealand dollar definitely aren't looking to high crates and they're in a recession, whereas the Australian dollar are not. You know, they're, they're pretty much the opposite. So for me, this starts to still now look like a, a decent trade to look to take.
Yeah. Okay. Okay. That looks quite nice. If it happens, because it might not happen, right? You could see this level could continue to fall and keep going down. Nobody knows, right? No one knows. It could. The market's going to see that as it might not see that as a um, as a bargain area, right? One thing I will say though, just just a note as well, that this was where you had also had a surprise rate hike. So this is where they hiked the um, the the, uh, the the Australian Central Bank. So this could also be supportive of this trade as well you could see that something like this happen it bounce off of that area there so that for me i think this whole area is quite nice because anyone who missed this move yeah in terms of buying at interest rates now can get a chance to get in at fair value the monthly fair value in conjunction with some liquidity hunting. So that's quite nice. Um, one second, let me just go back through some of the comments. Do, 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 do. One sec. Um, thank you, Alexandros. We do have a great group. Daniel says, uh, just closed all positions on oil. Decent profits. Not what I was expecting on, but I think they will take a lot of time to reach over 80 levels and I don't want to pay more broker fees might buy again at lows according uh, to what data says we need uh, we head into recession worldwide in a, in a near term uh, I'm still long time holding on copper even if um, I'm not on profits there too yeah so looking at oil what time is it now oh, bloody hell I've been talking for ages I'm gonna have to end this uh, this call in a sec um right looking at oil looking at the daily yeah we are in this um this auction aren't we Actually, let me just clear this up a little bit yeah we are in this auction we are in that auction between the 71s and the 798 just below the 80 right. area yeah. hello daniel yes i can hear you so I, I had uh, positions um, open from the top of the auction up to the lowest. And uh, I, I had some losses on the upper positions, mm -hmm. but uh, mostly 75% um, of my positions were uh, profitable. So Excellent. I, I took, uh, I took uh, the wins, you know, I, I increased my capital because I just, it's not worth to wait six, eight months on that only. I don't know because I just read some news that Iran is uh, uh, increasing uh, the production. Russia is doing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, undeclared uh, selling. And so it doesn't look too good in the long term. It will take uh, way too much time. So I'll buy again. I think I'll buy again around 70, 71, yeah. 72 is there. It's a good place to buy again, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm not buying at the highs right now. Yeah. So I took profits. And on, on copper, uh, uh, again, I am on profits right now but uh, i'm going to hold on until uh, it goes to four one four four something <coughs> uh, upper levels of the auction okay copper i i believe in copper way more than in uh, oil in that so okay yeah you can see the auction right here yeah yeah so at, at some point even if it's next year i don't care i know it will reach again over yeah. four and uh, that will be a really really good profit for me ah. so that one I, i'm holding Fingers crossed, man. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah, fingers crossed Thank for that. Um, so we're probably at what we would consider probably fair value at the moment, right? Fair value of this. This was definitely seen as bargain price. Prices made new highs. Prices come down. Again, a nice bargain price. It's a fair value. So personally, whenever I see prices come to fair value, I would take especially on something like the daily and an auction this wide, I would probably say take a little bit of profit. Mm. Or consider it anyway, just consider if you if you do or if you don't, um, again, depending on your, your, your medium to long-term plan, but I'm always of the opinion that, you know what, take a little bit of profit, even if prices do come back down to here, you can kind of reload, right? Yeah. Because yeah, nothing, nothing moves in a straight line, yeah. So that would yeah. be, 
yeah, that will, you can use those profits to kind of reload on these areas here. Yeah, on uh, on copper, I see you know, a slow but surely way up. Yeah, uh, it's a different market compared to oil. Mm. It's a, it's a less less things moving, you know, less uh, unknown in the equation with copper than with oil. Mm. That's going to be a really nice if that stop hunts right I, there. I don't see much volatility in, in copper as it, it is in oil. It's not so, so volatile, so I'm not expecting the prices to drop suddenly like it goes on way. right now oil is on 76 it might go to 72 tomorrow or mm. in a couple of hours yeah yeah with copper i don't see that happen right right yeah mm. yeah okay okay mm -hmm. yeah great analysis and thank you thank you for Let that how you guys you. trade trade um copper like with oil and that because i'm um with oil we follow opec and the eia and um, we follow this for fundamentals and we've got a basic idea how oil is moving but with copper um who like which which groups um uh, inform for the fundamentals around copper like I've, i cannot find nobody like with the gray markets we have the usda with the oil we have opec and eia but with copper who who do you guys follow well, one uh, one side I think is Kitco that uh, looks at the metals and analysis. Yeah, Kitco. You know, Kitco yeah, is one good one. Uh, and um, there is another one. Uh, yeah, I don't know it's Forex Live. Or, uh, is, I will post it in uh, in the group. It doesn't come to mind right now. But but, but with the, with with something like copper, I think it's more. It's not necessarily an intraday type of trade as um as uh, daniel was saying alexandros it's it's more of that of a very macro play so for example you know looking at china do you know what i mean looking at supply and demand that is really where you know you would kind of look to buy copper for the medium to long so you think about you know the fact that copper needs to be used in um oh what is it i think is it is it, is it the batteries or something like that as well in car batteries yeah, it's uh, car batteries. I think even solar panels and anything electrical. Actually, any any electronics. Yeah. Have copper. Your your laptop has copper in it. Uh, yeah. Everything absolutely. So uh, that's why copper actually is called Doctor Copper. Yes. So when you have uh, risk on, then copper will go up. That's yeah. It. Yeah. Very simple. And risk risk on meaning that you have growth in an economy, right? You have growth in global growth because you have more demand. You know, people willing to, you know, put more money into investments, etc., etc. So if you look at copper from more of a way more of a macro perspective, that's the reason why you kind of get into copper. Exactly. Yeah. I hope that I hope that helps, uh, Alexandros. Guys, thank you, Daniel. Really, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. You are welcome. No worries. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up now and it says, uh, da, 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 da. there's growth in China, just not heavy at the moment, but it's coming, uh, New Zealand, it just says New Zealand dollar, US dollar, right. So I'll cover New Zealand dollar, US dollar, and I'll cover Euro Aussie and then I will, and then I will go, right. Those two, seeing as Deirdre wanted me to cover those two right so uh currencies new zealand dollar us dollar so um yeah i was saying that there was an opportunity to kind of sell here which actually turned out to be a bit profitable there was a couple of uh, entries that you could have taken one was on the daily so actually let's let's uh, zoom out a little bit so you've got low high low yeah and so actually put it from here and so you've got an auction from here to here yeah which is 80 percent 